What's up, everybody? You're in the trenches with Dave Lapham. We're doing a live stream here right now from our beautiful studios at First Star Logistics, and uh, we want your participation. We're going to be giving away this jersey, and I'll personalize it, autograph it for you. The way to get uh, registered for an opportunity to get this jersey at the end of our live stream is to uh, type and enter into YouTube comments, hashtag who day, hashtag who day. And want you to bear in mind, once you enter, you don't have to continue to enter time and time and time again. One entry is all it takes. You're in and you're in for good. So let's uh, let's everybody participate, get going on that uh, little avenue right there, a little added treat to our live stream here. And it's around the holiday season. We're in the giving spirit. Give you a, a Bengals jersey, autographed, personalized. Let's have some fun in this live stream on this Thursday, December 2nd at 4 p.m. We're going to be talking about a big, big matchup. I mean, there's no question about it. The Bengals Chargers playoff implications for both football teams. The Chargers come in six and five, but the Chargers are, are in a little bit of a downturn. They started the season very, very strong. Uh, they started off the, the year handling business. In fact, they were four and one at the start of the season. They've gone two and four since. They're taking a lot of heat for handcuffing Herbert a little bit. So I expect them to try to take some deep shots early in this football game. So they're going to have to do a good job of uh, pressuring Herbert and controlling his wide receivers. Keenan Allen, this guy's good for 100 catches, 1,200 yards every single year. He's had 95 or more catches four years in a row. Made the Pro Bowl every one of those years. He's got a big wide receiver in Mike Williams, big six foot four inch guy that can get down the football field and make plays. He's also got a tight end in Jared Cook. That's a, that's a huge factor. And then Eckler coming out of the backfield. Austin Eckler is about as diverse a running back as there is in the National Football League. I mean, he's productive on the ground. He's productive in the air. He's got seven rushing touchdowns, seven receiving touchdowns, fifty one catches. For over 400 yards, he's rushed for over 600. He's uh, in the top three, I think it is, in scrimmage yards. Uh, top seven, I should say. 1,077 scrimmage yards. Top seven in the National Football League. So this guy's a weapon. They have plenty of offensive weapons. The Bengals' defense is going to have to rise up. And you guys could be a big factor. Show up. Get down to ball, Paul Brown Stadium. Make it difficult. For Herbert to communicate audibles and things of that nature to his to his uh, his teammates. I'd love to see a bunch of pre-snap penalties. Love to see mental mistakes because they couldn't communicate effectively up and down the line of scrimmage because of crowd noise. Make Paul Brown Stadium a tough place for the opposition to come in and play. That would be awesome if Paul Brown Stadium starts to get the reputation of oh, you don't want to go to PBS and that place you can't hear yourself think. That's big. That's what you call home field advantage. Let's uh, let's get this um, get this started a little bit. And Doug, Dave, on the offensive line, or can the offensive line be as effective if if Hopkins is out? Hopkins won't be out. Uh, Hopkins will be playing. Now Hill is the backup center, Trey Hill, and I think as the weeks go by, every single week he's progressing. Uh, he's learning more about life in the National Football League. Back a few weeks ago, when he incurred a penalty, it would bother him. You know, you have to compartmentalize. You have to get over it and move on. He let it bother him, and one bad play turned into another, and he's learned by that. Uh, but I do think that Trey Hopkins will be playing in this game. I'd, I'd be surprised if he's not. Um, and I, I think Riley Reef will give it every effort to play in this football game as well. Uh, he, they didn't practice yesterday. They may be limited if they practice at all today but they don't really have to practice. They're veteran guys that know everything there is to know um, about this offense and the offensive line play and calls and communicating. And they're in all the meetings. Uh, they're taking all the reps out in the football field, from a mental rep standpoint. So I'd be, I'd be surprised if Trey Hopkins uh, doesn't play in this football game. And I'd also be surprised if Riley Reef doesn't play in this football game as well. But the thing that uh, Trey Hopkins does give them is very, very, high football IQ, intelligence, 
reading defenses, recognizing calls that should be made to block those defensive configurations and communicating them up and down the line of scrimmage. So, and here's uh, Patrick Hayes's comment. Does anyone know what's going on with Riley Reef? He, he rolled an ankle. I saw him in the locker room on Monday and uh, he just turned an ankle over. So it's an ankle sprain. Uh, they can do some miraculous things in the training room uh, in terms of uh, injection and in terms of tape jobs and things of that nature. So in my mind, Riley Reef is a throwback. He's old school. If Riley Reef can walk. I think Riley Reef will play. And like I said, it, he doesn't need to take every single rep at practice, although he's the kind of guy that wants to take every single rep at practice. So um, I'm sure it's killing him not to be able to get out there and practice as much as he wants to uh, to get, get ready for this uh, this game with his teammates. So where are we? We with, we with David, Dave? Uh, David was the uh, very great game plan. What was his uh, his what? Great game plan to run the ball. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah, David, I like that. It was a great game plan, and and that and that game plan uh, should continue, I think. Um, but honestly, it would not shock me if the Los Angeles Chargers, after they saw what the Bengals did to the Pittsburgh Steelers, come right out of the locker room and put seven and eight in the box, and say, "You're not going to run the ball against us." like you did against the Pittsburgh Steelers. You're not going to mash us like you did against the Pittsburgh Steelers. So when they do that, Bill Burrow just spread them out by formation and slice and dice and throw. If they go big and load the box, Bill Burrow will spread them out and throw it. If they go small with, you know, sub packages, with defensive backs instead of linebackers in there, and they try to load the box that way, they'll still try to mash them in the running game some. So they, they've got... They've got answers to all the adjustments that uh, that people can can throw there at them, and, th and and that's the thing. In the National Football League, sometimes you have to run the ball to win the football game. Sometimes you have to throw the ball to win the football game. Offenses that are balanced enough to do both usually are the ones that make the playoffs. That's the bottom line. The other factor is if your defense keeps shutting down the opponent, and you ended up you end up building a a two score lead, it's easier to run the football because they're in a mindset where they have to throw it. And if they're unsuccessful throwing it because they have to, not because they want to, you're going to get the ball back quickly. And then you're going to be able to run the football, hopefully and melt clock and just uh, <laughs> put them in a meat grinder. So there's, there's different, every game's different. Every game unfolds differently. Uh, adjustments that are made during the course of the game by the coaches influence how much you run, how much you pass. The bottom line is, in that chess match that goes on during the course of a football game, adjustments and adjustments to adjustments that are presented by how the defense is playing as well as your offense and special teams with field position, everything that goes into it, you make adjustments to adjustments, and you're going to have to run it some to take care of business. You're going to have to throw it some to take care of business, and you never know how much of either one you're going to be able to do until the game's over and you've seen a final score and you understand why the final score is the way the final score is. Marlon, who's looking to be the punt and kick return of this Sunday? Well, I, I, I'm thinking that it will continue to be Darius Phillips. You know, he's, he's, the, he's the guy that's, uh, that's up right now on the depth chart. It's Darius in, uh, for both. Uh, Chris Evans is on there as kickoff return guy. But he's got a, a little bit of an ankle issue that he's dealing with as well. He didn't practice yesterday, and he might be limited today. Trenton Irwin is a return guy, but he hasn't been active the last few weeks. Uh, Tyler Boyd is another option back there from a return standpoint, if, in fact, you have to go uh, in that direction. So it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. But I do think that Darius Phillips is the guy that's going to get the shot at it first. And that's, that's an area that uh, the Chargers are pretty good at. Andre Roberts is a, is a, he's been around the league for a long time. I think it's like 13 years in the league and he's a pretty effective return guy and field position is going to be a big deal in this football game, just like it is in every football game. I mean, if the Cincinnati Bengals can put the chargers on long fields, drive after drive and accumulate some short fields of their own makes life a lot easier. And that's one of the factors that we talked about before that dictates how much you throw, how much you pass, all those kind of things, field position factors into it as well. 
Andrew, how does Derwin and his freakish athleticism adjust our game plan this week? Will Der- Derwin play more in the box? He's capable of it. That's the thing about him. Derwin is an athletic, genetic freak. There's no question about it. Let me take a look at his defensive numbers here. Derwin James, closing in on 100 total tackles, 93, 62 solo tackles. So he's in the box quite a bit. Uh, He's got five tackles for loss, so he's in the box quite a bit. Four quarterback hits. They blitz him. He's got a couple of interceptions. He's uh, defended five passes. He's forced three fumbles. This guy is a Pro Bowl-type football player. He's had injuries the last couple of years. He hasn't been able to stay on the football field. But when he is on the field, like he has been this year, he is a Pro Bowl talent at the uh, safety position. And that's the thing. You have Joey Bosa at the line of scrimmage. You have Derwin James patrolling the middle of the football field, whether it be in the box or back deep or intermediate or whether they want to line him up. I mean, he's athletic enough also to even line up outside and rush the passer off the edge like as a slot corner. I mean, you can do a lot of things with a guy like like uh, Derwin James. I mean, he is a marvelously gifted and blessed athlete. There's no doubt about it. John Harden says the Bengals have not faced many good offenses to this point. Do you think they'll be able to maintain the top 10 uh, defense with the tougher offenses coming up? I mean, it, time will tell on that. Uh, but the Cincinnati Bengals right now, uh, uh, defensively, they're tied for sixth in points allowed, and they're tied for sixth, or excuse me, they're sixth in points scored, tied for sixth in points allowed. There's only three other teams in the National Football League that are in the top 10 in both areas. Buffalo is tied for second in points scored, second in points allowed. New England, seventh in points scored, number one in points allowed. Belichick's got that defense playing lights out. Arizona, fifth in points scored, fourth in points allowed. The Bengals' point differential is they've scored 83 more points than the opposition. That's sixth in the National Football League. So they're sixth in all these categories. Like you say, uh, the defenses that the Bengals have have played against, they haven't been world beaters. I would say the Green Bay Packers, though, and Aaron Rodgers, obviously, were – about as good as it gets in the National Football League. The Bengals lose that game in overtime uh, at home. Uh, And then I would say Las Vegas is streaky, and the Bengals made them go in a poor run. I mean, the, the, the Las Vegas Raiders can score against anybody. They have scored against anybody. They put up over 30 against a lot of football teams. They only scored 13 points against the Bengals, and they were at home. The Bengals were the road team. That, to me, was a pretty damn good uh, performance. The Pittsburgh Steelers obviously are struggling, but you're right. The Chargers, the 49ers, uh, Shanahan is very, very creative in his run game. I mean, he schemes the run game up as well as anybody, and he also schemes his receivers open as well as anybody, and Jimmy Garoppolo and those offensive skill players take uh, the beneficiaries of all that. The Denver Broncos are a solid offensive football team. The Ravens, we know what the Ravens are, but the Bengals did uh, beat the Ravens in Baltimore, and they definitely put the clamps on Lamar Jackson as well, or better than anybody has. They held them to 17 points. That's a pretty good offense. Uh, The Ravens have scored points against quite a few teams. The Bengals get them again. Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs, and then Baker Mayfield, for whatever reason, has the Bengals' number. He's 6-1 and against the Cincinnati Bengals. Every other team in the National Football League on a combined basis, he's like five games under 500. The only reason he's a a plus 500 quarterback is that he's 6-1 and against the Bengals. Man, for some reason, uh, it just doesn't work out for the Bengals when they play Baker Mayfield in the Cleveland Browns. That was the Bengals' worst game of the season, obviously, losing 41-16 to the Cleveland Browns here in Cincinnati. That was as stunning as the two division wins when uh, they, they put 41 points on the board against Pittsburgh and Baltimore. So in this topsy-turvy National Football League, you just don't know. <laughs> you don't know. If you think that you got it figured out, you're about to lose a lot of money. What will Jackson Carmen's job be next year? Maybe right tackle? Could be. I think Hakeem Adeniji could be a hell of a right tackle. So it all depends on what they get in the draft. It all depends what they get in free agency. Um, 
it's one thing that it's it's good to have if you're an offensive lineman is position versatility. And Hakeem Adeniji, for the preponderance of his collegiate career, was a left tackle at the University of Kansas. He's a, he's an offensive tackle. So Jackson Carmen may uh, compete at the right tackle position. Hakeem Adeniji may compete at the right tackle position. Riley Reef may still be the left tackle, a uh, right tackle next year. You just don't know. Uh, the bottom line is the more good players you have to play multiple positions on the offensive line and one injury doesn't kill you, you have guys that can step in and guys that can move from one position to another and maybe multiple guys that can do that, the better off you are as an offensive lineman. So Jackson Carmen, in my mind, should not be thinking, I'm going to focus on being just this. I'm going to focus on being a right tackle for the Cincinnati Bengals. At this point in time, he should focus on being as good an offensive lineman as he can possibly be, wherever the hell they line him up. I don't care where it is. And uh, right now, Hakeem Adeniji is playing darn good football at the right guard position. He graded out well. I watched the tape. He, I thought he played very well. I thought he was very, very physical, as were everybody up front for the offensive line of the Cincinnati Bengals. Quentin Spain, he took Devin Bush on a 10-yard ride on one play, a little inside zone play, came off a double team and hit Bush and drove him 10 yards down the field, and Bush turned his back to him and ran away. I mean, he just rolled him. You have to, you have to buy a token. you got to buy a ticket for a ride like that at the carnival. And Quentin Spain just put him on skates. Big fella at left guard. Quentin Spain is playing very, very physical football as well. They all are. Frank Pollock's doing a hell of a job coaching these guys. When I watch this offensive line from the end zone tape, Frank Pollock is a disciple of Alex Gibbs and Jim McNally. And these guys are technician coaches. Technique. They teach technique. And the same technique over and over and over again. And when we were playing for Jim McNally, I remember our tape in 1981 and watching in 1988, that Super Bowl offensive line, it looked like 300-pound June Taylor dancers, all choreographed, all in total sync. Everybody was stepping with the same foot, hand placement with the same hand in the same spot on the defenders. I mean, it was all synchronized. It was unbelievable to watch. That's what's going on with this group. I watched the end zone tape of this offensive line. It's five 300-pound June Taylor dancers. That's all choreographed, and they're all doing the same technique, and they're all performing it very, very effectively, and they're getting better and better and better every single week. I'm excited about what this offensive line can bring them. Keith Brewer, do you think Puka Williams would get a chance to return kicks anytime soon? Well, yeah, he's been injured. Um, but he, he's a, obviously he's an option. He's a, he's a guy that uh, that has the the talent and the ability to do so. But he's been on the shelf for a while, so I'm not sure when that uh, when that opportunity might present itself. But there's no doubt that his skill set is something that uh, you know it lends itself to being able to be a successful return guy. I do know that you know Darren Simmons wanted him to really work on the first thing that you have to do as a return guy is not give your special teams coach a heart attack worrying about him catching the football. So first things first, make sure you're very, very solid and sound in tracking the football and catching the football. Don't want to have turnovers. You don't want to have giveaways uh, as, a, as a return guy on special teams. Those, would be, those are deadly. Your defense goes one, two, three, and out. Punt the ball 45 yards down the field. The return guy drops it. They recover it. They get a 45-yard flip and field position after having a three and out against them. And defensively, you have to – there's 45 yards of, of field that you didn't even get a chance to defend after holding a team to three and out. That is the stuff that just creates and takes away momentum. And momentum is a very powerful thing in any sport, particularly in football. You know when you have momentum and you don't want to lose it. You know when you got it, and you don't want to give it away. It's a very important thing, believe me. Randy Byers, the coach is working with Joe on his pocket awareness. Joe needs to get rid of the ball to avoid some of the sacks. Joe's pocket awareness is pretty darn good. I mean, uh, Joe, Joe Burrow has uh, that innate eyes in the back of his head kind of thing. He does have pocket awareness. He, he is able to manipulate the pocket pretty well. Um, I do think that 
the one thing about Joe, like you said, get rid of the football. Sometimes I think that from a decision-making standpoint, all right, throw it away, live for another down. Joe's so competitive and so talented. He wants to make something out of nothing every time. <laughs> and sometimes it's just not there. And you just have to give on it, but that's give up on it. But that's not in Joe Burrow's DNA. And the thing is, you've seen Joe Burrow pirouette, spin out of there. And I mean, his touchdown run was unbelievable. Highsmith has, you know, he beats Jonah on an inside move for pressure. And Joe Burrow just spins out, reverse spin out of there. It's out of pocket, gets to the perimeter. Minka Fitzpatrick's there to make a tackle on Joe Burrow at the two-yard line. He freezes Minka Fitzpatrick, who's a good open field tackler in space, gets inside of him, scores a touchdown, eight-yard touchdown run. Joe Burrow can do those kind of things. you know. Um, so as long as the positive plays that he's making because of his competitive spirit and his ability to execute those outweigh the negatives of him getting hit in the pocket, I think, you know, Everybody can live with it, but you hate to see him get smoked in the pocket. There's no question about it because a lot of times that's where it's a real problem. When he's out there on the perimeter by himself facing a one-on-one, -on -one, he knows exactly what's coming. In the pocket, when it's real busy and there's a lot of traffic, he gets hit by one guy and stood up and another guy falls on top of him. And it's like, now you have bodies falling everywhere. And, you know, it's a mass of humanity and a lot of poundage in terms of tonnage, in terms of body weight on the lower half of his body, that's where things can get problematic. Uh, but again, you don't want to see him get stroked and smoked out in the perimeter in a one-on-one -on -one situation either. And when he's out there, he's not protected anymore. He's not a quarterback in the pocket. He's a runner. And you can just lay him out. So, you know, Joe, Joe's a smart guy. Um, Aaron Rodgers is, is a quarterback, and others have done the same that have said to Joe, slide. <laughs> slide a little bit more. But again, Joe's DNA, I can do it. I'm going to win. I'm going to get this job done. I'm going to make a play. That's just Joe. And it's, it's worked well for Joe. He just has to uh, figure it out a little bit. So, oh, yeah, we also want to uh, let you guys know once again that uh, hashtag who day, hashtag who day is, is what you have to type in on the uh, YouTube comments in order to be eligible to win this football jersey right here. You can win this jersey. I'll personalize it, autograph it. Once we know who the winner is, we'll take care of you. Get a little uh, early holiday present to whoever you want it personalized to. And um, once you've registered, you don't have to continue to register over and over and over again. Person who registers once on YouTube comments, has an equal opportunity to somebody that's trying to do it a hundred times. It's a waste of your time. Waste of your time. Once you've registered, that's it. No more. Dave, we're getting a lot of questions about the weather mm -hmm. Sunday. The, the everyone's I already looking at the hundred percent chance of rain. I just checked my phone. 90% chance of rain Sunday. Talk about the weather and how it impacts a game plan. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's what the the AFC North the reason you have to have a running game is because of the weather in the AFC North. That's one of the reasons that everybody builds their offense around being able to run the football. Uh, if it's raining, the, the worst, the worst scenario is a slick pig, a slippery football. Now a running back can secure it and he's, he's in total control of it, but the center quarterback exchange, don't take that for granted. I've played center in wet conditions, icy conditions. It's not pleasant. It's not a fun thing. You have to make sure you have to, you have to over exaggerate how much time you make sure the quarterback gets the exchange before you start your blocking pattern, your blocking assignment. It, it really hinders you in execution. There's no question about it. Once that's executed, handing it off to the running back, you got to make sure that the handoff is secure. The back has to make sure that he tucks it away, but then throwing the football, you have to, it has to release from your hand properly. The receiver has to catch it properly and then tuck it away. I mean, there's, there's multiple stages to that. So the weather, 
I've played in games here in the Cincinnati area, as you guys all well know. I've had all four seasons in the same game. Well, you, you start the game out and it's, you know, 50, 60 degrees and the sun's out. And then all of a sudden this temperature starts to drop a little bit and it starts raining, continues to drop and it starts to turn to sleet, continues to drop and it starts snowing. I was in one of those games. It started out like 50 degrees. And by the time the game was over, it was literally like 28 degrees and snowing. And had gone through all these various stages of precipitation. So you almost have to run the football in those situations. So, yeah, it's, uh, it can affect game plan. It can affect, honestly, though, wet. Unless, unless the ball is just – my experience handling the football as a center, when the ball was soaked, it was easier to handle than if it was just a little wet. Because when it's just a little bit wet, the resin on the football – becomes, I mean, really slippery. If it's soaking wet, it's you can, you can grip it better. I, it almost sounds crazy, but when the ball is drenched, <laughs> I found it to be easier because they'll they'll keep toweling them, toweling them dry. But boy, once it's toweled and if it's just raining just a little bit and you just get a little bit of mist on that football, man, is that thing slick? It's just it, it's almost like there's, I don't know, it, it's almost like there's a <laughs> like a surfactant on the football or something it's crazy but when that baby's drenched you can grip it a little bit better all of those things are factors and then what comes into play there in in those situations particularly throwing the ball in those weather conditions how big is the quarterback's hand justin herbert's a big guy 6'4 238 pounds probably has a big hand joe barrow has got a good size hand joe barrow's not a small guy joe barrow has got a good size hand kenny anderson had big hands Big hands, even bigger hands than normal for his body type. In the freezer bowl, the reason that Kenny Anderson put up good numbers and Dan Fouts didn't, one of the reasons, Dan Fouts did not have a very big hand. He could not control the football in that bad weather. Ken Anderson could grip that football, get his hand around the football a little bit more. It was a factor in the freezer bowl. So all you people that are concerned about weather, that's an advantage for an AFC East, uh, AFC North team particularly when you're out practicing in it all week. If you're the Chargers, now rain is, the Chargers have played in rain. There's no question. But when you get, when you play in rain and the temperature's not in the 70s like it is on the coast or in the 80s or whatever it is this time of year out there, you come and you play in rain and it's in the 40s, high 40s maybe, that's a little bit different rain. It's a little bit different feel. So, Practicing in that sort of thing, and as the, as the weather continues to worsen, practicing in those weather conditions during the course of the week, it's a factor. It's a, it's a positive factor, and we'll see how it all plays out. There's no doubt. All right, Bengal, Ohio. What position do you think the Bengals will draft next year in the first round? Maybe cornerback? Maybe. Maybe an offensive lineman? Hopefully the Bengals are way down at the end of the first round. Um, you know, in the, in the, instead of being in the top five, maybe in the bottom five, of the first round, that'd be fine with me. And yeah, I mean, cornerback, you can never have enough good corners. You can never have enough good offensive linemen. Um, those are, those are two possibilities. I think though, there's so much to do in terms of studying the draft and where there's depth in, in various positions in, in terms of the draft. So right now, if you don't know, um, you know, where you're drafting, how high you're drafting, you, you'll be able to identify needs. And again, like you said, no, is it a glaring need? Well, you know, Trey Waynes has not been able to play for the football team at all again this year. I mean, I shouldn't say at all, very little this year. Didn't play at all last year. Very, very little this year on a percentage of snaps. So can you continue to count on them? It, it, his, his situation is remarkable to me because he hasn't had a prior injury history in college or in the pros. But boy, as soon as he came to Cincinnati, man, it all caught up to him in a, in a hurry. So I think his health is a factor or what you project his health to be. Um, there are a lot of things that are going to be going into the equation, but once the season's over and knock on wood, um, the Bengals continue to get through the year without any major injuries to players. That's always the thing. At the end of the year, you have to assess your injury situation. How well do you think certain players will come back from injuries? How significant are those injuries? 
Uh, are they potentially career ending, career threatening? So uh, there's so many factors in the equation. Um, but right now, they've really, really avoided the injury bug. And that's the thing that I think is going to be massive. In 1981, in 1988, when the Bengals won the AFC championships, they avoided major injury for a good part of the season to, to key performers. Uh, it, that's a big, big factor. If you've got the, the team that your coach counted on in training camp when they made their final cuts, if you've got that team throughout the entire course of the season and when it gets uh, to be crunch time down the stretch, you have the same players participating, that's a big deal, big deal, because you establish a rhythm and a coordination and a timing. So we shall see how it all unfolds. Andrew West, Eli Apple has been playing better over the last few games, but can he hold up against Allen and Williams? Seems like we have to shade Jesse to his side quite a bit. Very possible, Andrew. You know, he may get he may get more safety help than uh, Cheeto Awuzie gets. I mean, they may they may cheat a, a safety over there. I will say that Eli Apple, though, his confidence is rising. Interception in two straight games. Um, return both of those interceptions. I mean, his his confidence is 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 definitely a uh, a lot higher. But the 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 Los Angeles Chargers. They run a lot of option routes, particularly with Keenan Allen. He runs a lot of option routes that are dictated by coverage. So he and Herbert have to be on the same page. If they're not on the same page, if the receiver sees one thing and the quarterback sees another, that's when an, a, a potential interception can take place for Eli Apple. So he has to be on his toes with these option routes. And it'll be interesting to see how much man they play, how much zone. I mean, Lou Anarumo, obviously a, a big, big goal of his is to control Keenan Allen and to control Williams. I mean, Allen and Williams, that's a good tandem. And Cook at tight end is a is a hell of a player. And, uh, you know, coming coming out of the backfield, Eckler can get things done. I mean, that that's a good offensive football team. There's no doubt about it. They're, they're going to make some plays. Uh, the Bengals aren't going to shut them out. Uh, you know, maybe they will. But to think you're going to shut them down every single snap, I think you try to control the damage. At some point, they're going to make a play or two, and it's going to be how well do you put that away? One thing that Eli Apple has done when he has had issues, except for in Chicago, he let one bad play in the red zone turn into two or three, and it turned into a touchdown. But other than that, he's gotten over you know any misfortune and uh, come back and played pretty well. So um, it's going to be a a big big deal. A big part of this football game is how will the Bengals secondary handle these option routes that Keenan Allen runs. Uh, Williams is more of a, more of a deep threat guy. Uh, they, and, and they run RPOs, run pass options with uh, Eckler. And, and that's, it's a pretty good offense. I mean, if you, if you lean too much toward defending the pass, they'll hand the ball off to Eckler. If you're defending the run, they'll, they'll take it out of there, take it out of the belly and, and, and throw the football. And they're key in a defensive end or they're key in an outside linebacker in terms of if they're going to hand the ball to Eckler or if they're going to throw it behind that linebacker. I mean, they have a pretty darn good scheme going. So um, the Bengals' defense, they're going to have to be on their toes and, and reading their keys, dot the I's, cross the T's, be on their P's and Q's in terms of what their keys are telling them. Uh, defensively, that's for sure. Hey, I want to add something. I just got tapped on the shoulder. Yes. On top of the jersey, there's also going to be a $25 gift card to the Bengals Pro Shop. Okay. All right. So you take your jersey, wear your jersey to the Pro Shop with your $25 gift card, go in there, and they'll they'll take care of you <laughs> that, <laughs> at the Bengals Pro Shop down at Paul Brown Stadium. That's from the great folks at First Star Logistics. First Star Logistics coming through. They're in the holiday spirit. Tell you what, they take care of us, Dave. This studio, you can't beat it. This studio is awesome. I uh, really appreciate First Star Logistics for um, sponsoring us, taking care of us, doing things the right way at First Star Logistics. If they do it, they do it right. There's no doubt about it. So you get a jersey, you get a $25 gift card to supplement that jersey. Can't ask for more than that. This one's from Doug. I want to add something. Yes. Because I asked, because that is based on the jerseys that you wore yes not not the, the the new stuff that jersey by itself is three hundred dollars is that right is that because what, 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 i looked three hundred dollar value and that's not counting your signature which is even more than that <laughs> yeah, right 
that that uh, devalues the jersey. All of a sudden, the three hundred went down to about thirty thirty bucks it's worth at that point. <laughs> All right, Doug says, Dave, I believe the Bengals should. How about Doug? I believe the Bengals should extend Bates. And wondered how you felt about this. I like him a lot. I like him a lot too, Doug. I I think that he was very very honest, brutally honest about the admission that he had earlier in the season that it was letting it all get to him. It was affecting him. He was thinking too much about the contract and the negotiations and all that, and it was affecting his play. A lot of players would not step up to a microphone in a press conference environment and discuss that, that personal uh, scenario that he's dealing with. So I admire Jesse Bates. I admire him as a football player and as great a football player as he is. I think he's even a better human being. And I do think that he's a, He's a, a core piece of the foundation that the Cincinnati Bengals need to maintain and, and to hold on to. Let's face it. They basically redid the entire defensive football team over the last two years instead of, except for two guys, Jesse Bates at safety, at safety, Sam Hubbard at defensive end. You look at everywhere else. They drafted three new linebackers. Uh, the corners they got in free agency. Uh, the other safety, Von Bell, they got in free agency. The other edge rusher, Hendrickson, they got in free agency. Both the defensive tackles, Ogan Joby and Reeder, they got in free agency. I mean, they redid the whole defensive football team in free agency in the draft, except for two guys. Sam Hubbard is signed, and he's got an extension. Jesse Bates, I think, will be signed, and I think he will get an extension as well. At least that's my hope. I think that uh, I think the organization values Jesse Bates, and I think rightfully so. I think Jesse Bates has earned – uh, that value that they place on him. Robert Lanham, man, we're one one letter away from being brothers from another mother, Robert. With that N was a P, I'd have to, I'd have to, my dad was named with Robert Lapham. Robert Lanham, when I saw that, I'm like, wow. But Pops has been gone for a while. God rest his soul. So, Robert, I still have the New Jersey General's mini helmet you signed for me by mail a few years ago. Super cool. I do remember signing that. You're the best sports commentator in the business, Dave. Love you and Dan on the radio. Well, you're very kind, Robert. Maybe it is my father. <laughs> Robert, you're very, very kind. I do appreciate that. And uh, I do I do enjoy uh, the opportunity to do Bengals games on radio, uh, to, to have been involved in the National Football League for this number of years is mind-boggling. It really is. Uh, I think it's finishing up 46 between – it's my 36th year on radio and then 10 years with the Bengals as a player. And like you said, two years in the USFL. So from 1974 to today, just missed uh, that, that time frame, a couple of seasons um, of radio with the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, my last year of playing with the Bengals was 1983, 84 and 85 played with the generals in 1986, started doing the, the games on radio and been doing it ever since. And I uh, thank my, Lucky stars, and and I thank the Bengals organization, the Brown family, uh, for giving me an opportunity to play in the National Football League, and then to cover the National Football League from a broadcast standpoint. When done playing, luckiest guy in the world, and can't thank everybody enough. There's no doubt, and every single teammate, player, uh, coach, trainer, equipment guy, everybody, love you all. Everybody's been a part of. Uh, an incredible dream come true. No question about it. Andrew West, as Coach McNally said, Hakeem has sweet feet. No doubt about it. This kid, his lateral movement is as good as I've seen. I mean, this guy can slide, slide, kick slide. As, a, as an offensive tackle, you have to kick on a 45-degree angle and slide, slide, kick slide, slide your feet. He can do that. And he can redirect. He can plant his foot and get get back. And he does on a, he can change direction extremely quickly. And uh, you're talking about his size. That's the thing. He's not a, he's not a, a huge guy. Uh, he's over 300 pounds though, and he's got r- really sweet feet. When he snaps his hips, rolls his hips, he brings some thump. And uh, then he also has really good hands. He's got good hand placement, strong hands. When he gets his hands on you, he finishes you. And we said this many times in any athletic endeavor. It starts with your feet. You get in position to do things properly with your feet and ends with your hands. Whether it's throwing a baseball, catching a baseball, hitting a baseball, starts with your feet, ends with your hands. 
catching a football, throwing a football, blocking, tackling. Everything starts with your feet. If your feet can't get you in proper position, you're done. You're beaten from jump street. If your feet get you in, in a spot where you have an opportunity to succeed, eventually you're going to have to get it done with your hands. Akeem Adeniji has sweet feet and good hands. No doubt. Trey Wayne's ready to come back. Do you think they'll bench him with how well Apple is playing? That's Kyle's comment, Kyle Amick. Well, Kyle, I mean, I'm not sure that they bench him. Um, I'm not sure if Trey Wayne's comes back ready to play. I don't throw him out there for every snap. I might work him into the mix a little bit. I might have him, you know, maybe have him out there as a corner and put somebody else in the slot as a nickel. If he's better on the outside, put Eli in the slot or whatever the case may be, Woozy in the slot, wh wh however it works out. But if he comes back healthy and he's ready to play and he's one of the top three corners, um, I think more snaps are played in today's National Football League with the passing games that these teams all implement. You need three corners. Actually, you need four. You need at least four good corners. <laughs> That's what you need because three of them are going to be on the field at the same time, a ton of snaps. There's absolutely no question about it. And, and just because a guy starts a game doesn't mean that he's got more value than a guy that doesn't. Sometimes a guy will start a game because of a, a formation that a team comes out in that dictates that he starts that game. Which guy is giving you the most snaps? If you're, if you're on the football field, 65 snaps is defense. Which cornerbacks are giving you the highest percentage of those snaps starting isn't as big a deal as it used to be in, in terms of uh, skill players, because, you know, everybody runs so many different things. They'll run two tight ends. They'll run three wide receivers. They'll run empty backfield with four wides. I mean, they'll run all kinds of stuff. So who is giving me the most snaps? Is it the fourth and fifth receiver are giving me more snaps than, you know, than the second running back? Um, it, all those things are, you know, way into the equation and how you defend it, uh, dictates how many snaps people are going to get as well. So starting is always a big ego thing, but who is giving me the contribution number of snaps? That's, that's the big deal in my mind. Joshua. Yes. So again, first star coming up strong, coming up strong. They're in a giving mode as they always are. <laughs> yeah. So. Basically, if we can get 70 likes on our YouTube channel on this page on the, the thread right now uh -huh. of the live stream, yeah, they're gonna bump that $25 gift card to a 50. They're gonna double down, yeah, double down 50. So $50 we hit that like shop. button, you get that. Uh, so the, the YouTube, uh, the comments, do, do your hashtag who day, type it in on uh, on YouTube comments. We get that bad boy up to at least 70. Hit, hit, hit like. Hit like. Okay. The like button. Hit the like button. And if we get that uh, 70 likes, get it up to 70, going to double it. 25 bucks becomes 50 bucks. Not bad. Not bad. First are our logistics. Taking care of not only us, taking care of you. Might as well remind people about it. One more day. Yeah, right. You, we, we, this is the final day, or tomorrow's the final day of the sweepstakes, and uh, the information uh, you can find it find it below the information for the sweepstakes. But it's a three thousand uh, dollar prize, three thousand dollars cash for your Christmas shopping. Uh, it's an iPhone 13, state of the art iPhone that uh, you, you can uh, enjoy there. It's dinner at Jeff Ruby's. Uh, dinner. I'm going to be bringing my wife. You can bring your wife, significant significant other, whatever that may be. I will enjoy a nice uh, steak at Jeff Ruby's, one of the best in the world, not just in the Cincinnati marketplace. Uh, and then uh, also autographed jersey, uh, a, a football, autographed football, and then two tickets to one of the remaining home games as the Bengals make that final push to the playoffs. So you have to register by tomorrow. And you can register multiple times on that bad boy, but you have to participate. You have to get involved now because a lot of people have already registered. And uh, oh, ho, ho. First star taking care of you in the holiday season. Hope you guys all had a great Thanksgiving and ate a lot of turkey. But now 
Santa Claus time. And first of all, it's just going to help you be Santa Claus. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. We'll probably do another live stream next week to announce those winners. The winners. Okay. Joshua, what kind of defenses have the Chargers faced in comparison to Cincinnati? Let's go through their schedule, Joshua. The Chargers opened up at the Washington football team. Pretty good defense. They only scored 20 points. They held the Redskins to 16. They played the Dallas Cowboys when Dallas was still healthy, and they were playing much better defense at that point in time. Uh, and they lost that football game. They only scored 17 points. Dallas beat them 20 to 17. Kansas City Chiefs have struggled all year long defensively, and they scored 30 against Kansas City, 30 to 24 victory. Uh, Las Vegas Raiders, they scored 28 against the Raiders. They held the Raiders to 14 points, 28 14 win. Cleveland, 47 42 shootout. So that, that, that was an interesting football game. The Ravens, we know they have a good defensive football team. Now they're, they're struggling with some injuries as well. They get smoked by Baltimore, 34 to 6. The Ravens held them to six points and scored 34. Patriots, good defensive football team. Their Chargers scored 24 points, but lost 27 24. Philadelphia Eagles, up and down, streaky football team. Chargers scored 27 points and beat them 27 24. Minnesota Vikings, we know Mike Zimmer can put together good game plans. That's a pretty solid defensive football team. They have uh, good edge rush people. Chargers scored 20 points, but the Vikings scored 27. Pittsburgh Steelers, we know that defense is struggling a little bit. We just saw the Bengals hang 41 on them. 34 by the offense, 7 by a pick 6. Pittsburgh beat them 41-37. The Steelers scored 28 points, 27 or 28 points in the fourth quarter of that football game. The Denver Broncos, uh, the, the Chargers only scored 13 points on the Denver Broncos. Good defensive football team. And uh, they win that, uh, they lose that football game 28 13. That defensive football team, Vic Fangio, the, uh, the head coach of the Los Angeles Chargers, Brandon Staley, is a Vic Fangio disciple. So it's surprising to me that his defense is having such a hard time stopping the run. One other thing I wanted to make mention of. Uh, when I was talking about finishing football games in the, in the, in the fourth quarter, we did keys uh, to, the, uh, to the victory. This Los Angeles Chargers football team has six wins. Five of those six wins, Justin Herbert led come-from-behind victories in the fourth quarter. Five of their six wins. He's had six of those in his first two years as a starting quarterback, fourth quarter wins, five of them this year. So this football team... You never should feel the game's over. It's not over until the gun goes off, until that final whistle, because they are a come-from-behind team like we talked about. They scored 100 points in the fourth quarter, tied for fourth most in the NFL. The Bengals scored 102, third best in the NFL. Both teams have been fourth-quarter offensive juggernauts. The problem is the Chargers have given up 101 points in the fourth quarter. <laughs> They're minus one. In the fourth quarter, the Bengals are plus 17. The Bengals have given up 85, but that's the most points scored and allowed in, in a quarter has been the fourth quarter for both teams. So they saved the fireworks for the end of football games. Hopefully this one's decided. Uh, the, the Bengals are up more than a score in the fourth quarter because a one score game means nothing to Justin Herbert and the Chargers. We'll see how this one unfolds. Ready to wrap up. Okay. One more chance. One more chance to win right here. Yeah. Okay. Right here, you can get this uh, jersey. Hashtag who day. Type it in on the YouTube comments, and uh, you can win yourself this jersey. And I will personalize it to whoever you decide that is you, or if it's a family member or a friend or somebody that you want to take care of at Christmas time, whatever it may be. Um. And a gift card to the pro shop. $25 at, at this point, unless we get 70, 70 likes, 70 likes, and then it'll double to 50, $50 gift card at Paul Brown stadium at the pro shop. All right. So Andrew, any concern about managing Mixon's workload? Evans has seen more run lately. Will that continue to increase? 
I'll tell you, watching Joe Mixon, he, Andrew, he is a genetic freak. <laughs> I mean, this this guy, he looks fresh as a daisy after carrying the ball 30 times in a football game. This dude is put together. But you're right. You, you're not going to pound him 30 times, you know, a game uh, like, like the Titans do with Derrick Henry. I mean, Derrick Henry is an exception to the rule. I, I do think that 20 to 25 carries, 22 to 25 carries for Joe Mixon, and maybe supplement uh, you know him him a little bit with with others as you mentioned. Although you know you get a situation where Evans has got an ankle injury, he's got an ankle problem. But Samaj P. Ryan is another guy that can get carries and take the burden off of Joe if necessary. But right now, man, he is running so well. And you know sometimes when when you have the perfect relationship between offensive line and running back, when they are on the same page, when they are in the rhythm and the timing that this offensive line has going with Joe Mixon, you're hesitant to, to uh, disrupt that as such. So it'll be interesting. I, I do think that obviously Joe's going to get a high, high, high percentage of the carries, but uh, you know, there, there's ways to uh, give Joe Mixon a blow, but man, he is in unbelievable shape. He's so well conditioned. This, this guy is a, He's cut, man. He's chiseled. And he when he when he lowers those shoulder pads and finishes runs, he doesn't get knocked backwards. He's gonna gain a yard, two yards, three yards, maybe even four. But that body lean and the power he's got, and he squares his shoulder pads up. He's he he runs angrily. He finishes runs. Yo, it's Joe. What up, Joe? Hey Dave, do you have any stories about Ken Riley? Kenny Riley, one of the greatest human beings ever. And one story about Kenny Riley is uh, when I was a rookie, Kenny Riley was one of the first veterans that was really kind. <laughs> you know, it's it's rookies. Paul Brown really didn't believe in hazing rookies. Rookies didn't have to get up and sing for dinner and all that sort of thing. And, um, you know, it's like, you're here to make a football team just like the veteran players. But there was a little bit of a divide, you know, until you were accepted, until you made the football team and you were accept, accepted by veteran players. But very, very early uh, up in Wilmington at my first training camp, I was in the locker room pretty early getting some things ready for for practice. And Kenny Riley came in. He came out of the training room. He just had his ankles taped. And uh, he, he came over, sat down, and, and just uh, – just started asking me about, you know, am I married? Do I have kids? What, what's your life like? I mean, just an unbelievable guy. And, you know, encouraged me, man, you keep doing what you're doing. You're going to help us. You're going to make this football team. You're really going to help us. And coming for a guy from a veteran player like Kenny Riley, that meant the world. That meant the world to a, you know, a green inexperienced rookie. There's no question about it. Um, so that comes to mind. Just immediately finding out the kind of, uh, you know, guy he was in terms of how you could count on him as a person. I do remember too. Um, my brother-in-law had a, a, a bull mastiff dog by the name of Chidiog. And my son was probably about six years old at the time. And we had Chidiog down at the practice facility. And he was a big bull mastiff. And he ran my son over. Um, they were playing football. He and Kenny Anderson's son, Matt, they were playing a little football out in the field after practice, and Chidiog got loose and just ran my son over playfully. But, man, my son, he went straight back, and his toes were pointing to the sky, and he landed on his backside, and he bounced right back up. And Kenny Riley was so impressed. He ran over to my son, little lab. Man, you tough, man. You tough little lab. And he came up to me. Man, your son, that's the toughest little guy I've ever seen. It was, it was kind of funny when it happened. It was, it was scary at first, but then when he got up right away, I knew he was okay. It, it was it was pretty funny, but uh, Kenny Riley got a huge kick out of that. And he could not believe how big Chidiog was. This big old bull mastiff man. He he thought it was as big as a horse. But uh, Kenny Riley, just a a tremendous tremendous football player, and even a better human being if you can believe that. He was, he had it all special guy and i know he's in a special place right now and that's exactly where he deserves to be no doubt about it all right keith man keith or 
didn't get me get me going about Kenny Riley. Boy, memories come flooding back. How excited are you to watch Trey Hendrickson line up against the Chargers rookie left tackle? That's going to be an interesting battle because Rashawn Slater, good football player out of Northwestern. Bengals liked him a lot. Bengals liked him a ton. And he's very athletic. And I am excited to watch him uh, go up against the rookie because he destroyed a rookie last year, uh, last week, I should say. In that, in that football game against the Pittsburgh Steelers, I want to make sure I get his name right. I don't want to guess on it. Moore, the rookie tackle, got destroyed. Trey Hendrickson got multiple pressures, not just on the quarterback sack strip, on the interception that Mike Hilton took back to the house, he pressured Ben. Um, he, he pressured and bull rushed more into Ben multiple times. It, it was it was a very, very impressive showing by Trey Hendrickson. He affected Ben Roethlisberger more than a handful of times during the course of that football game. So sacks are one thing. Affecting a quarterback where it ends up in an interception is another thing. Affecting a quarterback where it in, ends up in an interception score is a third thing. <laughs> and just speeding the quarterback's clock up is big, big. You know, if you cut 10, 10 percentage points off of his completion percentage because of making the quarterback uncomfortable, either by hitting him or getting him off the spot or hurrying his throw, you know, speeding that clock up, those things are all big, all immeasurable. And Trey Hendrickson is doing exactly that. You know, when you look at Trey Hendrickson, like I said, this year, 10 and a half sacks tied for six in the NFL. It's not like he had a five sack game against a guy that couldn't play and padded his stats every single week. He's got a sack in seven straight weeks, franchise record. It's the longest active streak in the NFL currently. Nobody has a sack in more than seven straight weeks. Trey Hendrickson is the only guy that's got it done. So <laughs> he's got a sack in nine of 11 games this year. Nine of 11 games. So I'm talking consistency. In nine games, he has 10 and a half, nine of 11 games, he has 10 and a half sacks. That on a week-by-week -week basis. And sacks, that's one measurement, but I'm talking about the consistent pressure that he's putting on as well and shrinking the pocket and the things that he's doing. 24 sacks in 27 games. 24 sacks in 27 games. Third most sacks in those 27 games. 16 last year, 11 this year. The only two that have more sacks than his uh, 24 are T.J. Watt with 27 and a half in 27 games. And Miles Garrett with 26 in 27 games. Then Trey Hendrickson is third in the entire league in the last 27 games. What's the common denominator? They're all in the AFC North. Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Cleveland. Everybody's got an edge guy in the AFC North. In the AFC North, the idea is to stop the run, earn the right to rush the passer, and have a stud or more on the edge and get – consistent pressure from everybody out of your defensive line. That is the recipe for success in the AFC North. Run the ball, stop the run. When you stop the run, you earn the right to rush the passer. Trey Hendrickson is amongst three, the top three in the National Football League in the last 27 games. Now, granted, 16 of those games were with the Saints last year, but the point is he is getting it done on the edge for the Cincinnati Bengals with Sam Hubbard. Going to my first Bengals home game this weekend, all the way from Tacoma, Washington. Whew. My flight is tomorrow. Can't wait for Sunday. Who day? And I want to add, he has a comment later where he's asking for recommendations of what he should do when he gets to Cincinnati. So get you put your Chamber of Commerce hat on as well. <laughs> I'm probably the wrong guy to ask. I think my wife might be a better person to ask about what to do when you come to Cincinnati, but I, we're, we're glad you're traveling to Cincinnati. Uh, obviously, we, we talk about Jeff Ruby's. If you want a good steak, Jeff Ruby's Steakhouse. If you, want a, if you want a great meal, check out Jeff Ruby's Steakhouse downtown. I think you'll find, find – if you stay in downtown, I think you'll find downtown Cincinnati beautiful. And uh, welcome to Cincinnati. We hope uh, that you're taken care of at Paul Brown Stadium in the, in the night before in Cincinnati and and uh, hope the Cincinnati Bengals make your trip worthwhile and you have a good flight back to Washington. That's a long trip. Well, that, and that's the thing, too. 
I remember going out to the West Coast. That's a challenge. But coming from the West Coast to the East Coast, it's a 10 o'clock kickoff their time. When you travel West to East, but on their clock, that's a 10 a.m. kickoff. Now, I don't think they're going to come out the day before the game. If they do, I'd be surprised. I have a feeling they're going to travel in on, on Friday and try to get their clocks adjusted a little bit. But that's a tough dynamic. And they've done it before, and they've done it successfully. But uh, I just think that that's a factor in the football game. I really do. I think that when you're traveling multiple time zones and coming to west to east, I think is tougher than going east to west. I really do believe that. We'll see. All right, Dan. We've been on here for an hour. An hour. This is, this is time this flies is, when you're having fun, Dan. Time flies. How many more you want to take? How many more questions? Let's take a couple more. How about if we just try to, uh, like, get up to the top of the hour, take a couple more questions, and I got uh, got some family obligations that we I have to get involved with here shortly. Okay. What about putting Mixon and Piran on the field at the same time? That could happen. That could happen. I think that could definitely happen in short yardage goal line situations. Um, you know, you got guys that could block for each other, willing blockers. They both played together at Oklahoma. They're both very good friends. They're both playing together in the National Football League for the Cincinnati Bengals. I do think that uh, that that's something that you you could formation them out on the football field at the same time. But I, I, I'm not sure you would do that necessarily to take a tight end off the football field um, that can, you know, uh, block at the line of scrimmage and catch the football as a receiver or one of the receivers that might be out in a route. I mean, obviously you have Samaje on the field. You're taking somebody off the field that might uh, give you a little bit more diversity from a weapon standpoint, but Samaje is a good receiver out of the backfield as well. He's not just a one trick pony. Both of those guys will block for each other. Both of those guys are capable runners. Both of those guys are capable receivers. So it's not like you're totally hamstringing your offense by putting them out on the football field at the same time. But uh, that's that's not not a formation that is, I think, we're going to see a whole lot from a percentage standpoint down the stretch. But you never know. We shall see. Injuries and everything else, who knows? All right, Randy Byers, last question. Based on what you've seen so far in the AFC, who would you consider more talented than the Bengals? Oh, boy. All I know is, Randy, the AFC, 12 of the 16 teams of the AFC are 500 or better. 12 of the 16. Everybody's fighting for a playoff spot. The Bengals in a two-week time frame went from the number one seed in the AFC, if the playoffs were to start the next day, all the way out, dropped down to like number five or six by losing two games. You lose two games to the to the quote, team you can't really lose to, that's a division rival. You get a conference loss, a division loss, tiebreakers galore. I mean, if, if you lose a division game, you can drop down a, a bunch of spots in terms of playoffs. So it, it's going to be, a, it's gonna be a, a challenge. It's going to be a battle royale. There's, there's no question about it. I mean, and, and, and the thing is, for three straight weeks in the National Football League in its entirety, I know you're talking about the AFC, but a sub-500 team beat a division winner four times, three straight weeks, four different games it happened. And then the, uh, the, the fourth week, it happened three times. Three sub-500 teams beat a division leader. Man, you just, you just never know. I think talent's important, obviously, but I do think, look at the Rams. They went out and tried to buy a championship. Odell Beckham, you know, Trading uh, for Matthew Stafford, you know, or, or getting him trading for him, getting him signed. They tried to buy a football team. How's that working out so far? Talent is valuable, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a really good team. Talent and team, they start with the letter T, but there's all kinds of other intangibles that go with it. And sometimes when you have too much talent, Guys start, their egos take control and they start fighting over roles. That's the one thing about this football team that I really respect. Every one of these receivers have immense talent for the Cincinnati Bengals. But I'll see Jamar Chase celebrate a block that he had for Joe Mixon down the football field that sprung Joe for a 32-yard gain instead of a 15-yard gain, and he's celebrating like he scored a touchdown. 
to me, that's what makes this football team special is guys are not jealous of other people's success. They, they relish in other people's success. Now, you know, everybody wants targets, but it's not like if I don't get my six targets, man, I, you know, I, I'm not playing. It's nothing like that. Um, this football team can beat you in a lot of ways. And I, and I think that it is a team. They really do like and respect each other. When you like your teammates, that's powerful. When you respect your teammates, it's equally powerful. When you have both, it's like peanut butter and jelly. They're both good. They're better together. When you both like and respect your teammates and your coaches, big things can happen. And that's what I see going on with this football team. Player to player, coaches, and then players to coach, coaches to players. There's a really good mojo going on with this football team. And I think it's going to stand them in good stead down the stretch here. We shall see. We appreciate uh, everybody jumping on this live uh, presentation from our studios and First Star Logistics in the trenches with Dave Lapham. It's time to give away the jersey. Time to, to, and to draw, a $50 the, gift draw the big winner. It, got, it doubled up. It doubled up. Doubled up. Okay, we got 70 people that, uh, that, that uh, activated and hit the number for us to double down. So here we go. We're going to give away the jersey right now. We'll contact you and see how you want this jersey to be uh, personalized, if in fact you do it all. And if you want it personalized to you, Nathan, or a family member or a good friend or whatever the case may be, we will take care of you, Nathan. How do they do that, Dave? How are we going to contact them? Are they going to contact us? Or We'll work on that when we get off, all right. off air. Okay. So within the next few hours here, we'll, we'll make sure we get that done. All right, Nathan, um, we'll be, we'll be uh, reaching out to you. So never fear. The jersey's yours. Thanks again, everybody. $50 gift card as well for the pro Oh, shop. yeah. Yeah, $50 gift card. So you can supplement it, or you can get separate gifts for two different people. Nathan, you could be the man. You could be a hero. There's no question about it. Everybody have the best weekend you ever had. One more thing, Dave, yes. before we go. Yes. We got to remind everybody, tomorrow, December 3rd, 8 o'clock, ends it's the end of the, the entries for the, raffle. for the sweepstakes. Okay. And I'll let you, again, one last time, tell them. I mean, this is... This First Star Logistics came up big on this. This is big. If you think First Star Logistics took care of you with the with the uh, game jersey and uh, $50 gift card at the Paul Brown Stadium gift shop, pro shop, that's only the beginning. Tomorrow night, 8 o'clock, deadline. Information how to register is below. You can do it multiple times. If you haven't done it, you better get started because a lot of people have registered. For, I want to add, it, yes. it, it's simple because there's things like – Follow you on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do things with the, the YouTube channel. There's different things they can do to multiple get, ways to register. Get entries. Okay. And so it's not like you just have one time. Every time it has, you know, you may have one thing you do, it gives you 10 entries. So you have a great chance. Okay. And you've only got oh about 27 hours. <laughs> so you got to get at it. Tomorrow night, eight o'clock is the deadline. Again, the prizes, $3,000 cash. That's, uh, that'll help Santa Claus. That'll help you during the holiday season. And iPhone 13, state of the art, nothing better. You'll be able to contact everybody and anybody that you want to. And then uh, dinner, Jeff Ruby's, two of you, myself and my wife. Dinner for four, you and a significant other, wife, whoever it may be. I'm bringing my wife. Great steak, Ruby Steakhouse, as good as it gets anywhere in the world. And then a, game, a jersey, football jersey, signed, signed football, and two tickets to a home game, not a playoff game, a home game in the regular season as the Bengals make their drive toward the playoffs. So you'll be able to have a couple of tickets to, to a home game at Paul Brown Stadium. Be proud and be loud, just like we need everybody to be this weekend against the Los Angeles Chargers. 
make that a long flight home. That could be a long three, four hour flight if the Cincinnati Bengals spank the Los Angeles Chargers. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate y'all. Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. Opportunity knocking.